on June 23rd, 2018, a group of 12 boys who were part of a soccer team in Thailand never came home after practice. And I was thinking about this story this week because of our connection to Thailand, but also how it relates to our text. Their parents began to worry, began to call around to other parents to see if anyone had any idea about where the boys had gone. It turns out that after practice that day, these 12 boys and their coach, 13 people in total, went to explore some, some caves nearby, caves that stretched underground for some six miles. And while they were inside the caves looking around, they didn't know that rains that were not supposed to start for another month began to fall. And suddenly these boys and their coach were trapped inside with no way of escape. And the rains would continue for the coming months to the point where in the very near future, the caves would be completely submerged. There would, no, there would be no way of escape and the boys would die unless something happened. Now, can you imagine as a parent, the panic? thinking that your kids had gone to soccer practice and then suddenly they're fighting for their lives. All sons between the ages of 11 and 16 years old, imminent danger, and there was nothing that you could do to help them. And so the parents cried out to the Thai government and the Thai government responded. They began to recruit expert cave divers in their own country, but also from countries around the world to help organize a daring rescue. After about nine days, of no contact with the boys, and the boys not sure if anybody was ever going to come and help them or save them, two divers were able to dive through the the difficult waters, the difficult uh, caverns of this cave, and about a mile and a half inside the cave, they found the boys. And all of them were okay. Now, they were hungry. Oxygen levels were falling to dangerous levels, but there was hope. They had to find a way to get them out. Now, this is going to be difficult, though, because in order to get them out, the kids were going to have to dive in very small openings. Some of them, some of these small openings were three feet wide, two feet tall, and no visibility. No visibility. And the divers were sure that if the kids were taken on these dives, they would panic. Listen, I'm panicking just describing it to you. Can you imagine what it would feel like to to have these, and, and, and there was water, like, uh, currents ripping through, rocks falling everywhere. It was a dangerous, dangerous dive. But thankfully, one of the skilled divers who came to help with the rescue was an anesthesiologist. And what they ended up doing was they put all of these kids under anesthesia, gave them oxygen tanks, tied them to flexible stretchers. They made them kind of human body ba- human duffel bags. And then they, they guided them through these treacherous waters to safety. It was, it was remarkable. Not a single kid, not the coach, none of them died. They were all brought to safety. Listen, over more than two weeks, Somewhere between 5,000 and 10,000 people, including 2,000 soldiers, 200 divers, volunteers from literally all over the world, some 17 countries represented in this rescue, worked together to bring all of these human beings to safety. Incredible. Think about it. All these people were willing to leave their homes leave their jobs, use their skills to help people they did not even know. In fact, two of the Thai Navy SEALs lost their lives as a result of the rescue. The prospect of death, the prospect of the death of these young boys moved people to action. The prospect of their physical death led these people to action. And church family, I'm sure you can see the parallels between the actions of the heroes in this story and the call that God has placed upon us as his people. Because as the people of God, we are called to be not only moved by the prospect of physical death, we are called to be moved by the reality of spiritual death, of eternal death. The promise of eternity must weigh on us because there are more than 13 lives 
on the line. There are billions of eternities at stake. Now listen, I know as a church, we talk about evangelism, missions, discipleship a lot. And I'm so grateful to be a part of a church that takes these things seriously, these essential acts of the church. I'm so glad to be a part of a church that takes the Great Commission seriously, where we send people to places like Thailand, where the the people there need the gospel. But I don't want us to grow indifferent about these things. As we hear about them, as we talk about them, as we discuss the the gospel need that is present here and around the world, the danger is that we we become so familiar with them that the, the need, it doesn't take root in us in the way that it used to. We become desensitized to it. And so here's the question that I want us to ask this morning that I think that we must consistently ask, constantly ask as the people of God. It's a question that's demanded of us from Esther chapter 8. Are we content with our own salvation? I don't mean content in the sense that we are pleased that God saved us. Of course we are. But what I mean is this. Are we so content with our own salvation that we lack compassion for those who have not yet been saved? are Are we so content in the fact that we've been rescued, that we've escaped the fire, that we're out of out of danger, that we've forgotten that what we have been rescued from is still the reality of billions of people around the world today, in our neighborhoods, in our communities, our schools, our jobs, our state, our country? Are we moved to action because of the possibility, the the reality of death? Here's our our main point that I want us to take away from Esther chapter 8 this morning. The gracious salvation, it is gracious, The gracious salvation that we have received in Christ should compel us to seek the salvation of those who have not yet believed. The gracious salvation that we have received in Jesus Christ through his atoning work, through his gospel, it should compel us to act as Jesus has, to seek the salvation of those who have not yet believed. As we turn to Esther chapter 8 this morning, remember we are now seeing the full effect of the great reversal that we began to witness in chapter 6. Haman has not only been humiliated, he has now been executed. And everything that Haman hoped to happen to Mordecai has now been done to him. But there's still this lingering question about the edict. Haman is out of the way, yes, but the king has still authorized the destruction of the entire Jewish people in the Persian Empire. So the question remains, how will they be saved? How will all God's people be saved? And chapter 8 tells us how God orchestrates these final movements of salvation. And it begins with a compassionate appeal. In the first two verses of chapter 8, things are looking really great for Esther and Mordecai. Look at these verses with me. On that day, the day that Haman was executed, hung on the gallows, on that same day, King Ahasuerus gave to Queen Esther the whole house of Haman, the enemy of the Jews. And Mordecai came before the king, for Esther had told what he was to her. And the king took off his signet ring, which he had taken from Haman, and gave it to Mordecai. And then Esther set Mordecai over the house of Haman. Think about the the continued trajectory up here. Esther receives all that Haman once owned. Mordecai is revealed to be her caretaker, and he takes Haman's place as chief advisor to the king. And if that weren't enough, Mordecai then is placed by Esther as the overseer of all the house of Haman. The hits just keep on coming from Haman, even after he died. And the fortunes of Esther and Mordecai keep rising. But surprisingly, Esther is not satisfied. Well, I'm sure she was appreciative of all the king had given to her and all the king had done for her, she wants something else. There were two parts to her request. And even though the king has answered one, there's another part that she wants him to deal with as well. Look at verses 3 to 8 with me. Then Esther spoke again to the king. She fell at his feet and she wept. She pleaded with him to avert the evil plan of Haman the Agagite and the plot that he had devised against the Jews. And when the king held out the golden scepter to Esther, Esther rose, 
stood before the king, and she said, if it please the king, if I have found favor in his sight, if, if this thing seems right before the king, if I'm, if I'm pleasing in his eyes, let an order be written to revoke the letters devised by Haman the Agagite, the son of Hamadatha, which he wrote to destroy the Jews who were in all the provinces of the king. For how can I bear to see the calamity that is coming to my people? How can I bear to see the destruction of my kindred? And then King Ahasuerus said to Queen Esther and to Mordecai, the Jew, behold, I've given Esther the house of Haman. They've hanged him on the gallows because he intended to lay hands on the Jews. But you, Raymond, right, as you please, with regard to the Jews, in the name of the king and seal it with the king's ring for an edict written in the name of the king, sealed with the king's ring, it cannot be revoked. Esther falls before the king. She pleads for the salvation of her people. Remember, Ahasuerus, you asked me two things. What is my wish? What is my request? I wished for my life to be spared, and I requested that the lives of my people be spared. You've granted me my wish. What of my request? You see, for, for Mordecai and Esther, their salvation was not enough. They could not enjoy the freedom the gifts they had been given, the blessings of the king so long as their, their people remained in danger, so long as there was the prospect of death lingering in the kingdom. There was too much at stake for them to stay silent in the house of Haman. And just for a moment, can we marvel at the transformation of Esther here as we've, as we've read about her story from the beginning now to almost the end? Esther's quite a different woman here in Esther chapter 8 than she was earlier in chapter 3 and chapter 4. This beautiful woman chosen from among all the women of the empire who had so identified with her land of captivity that she was not noticeably Jewish. This woman who had so insulated herself from her own people that she didn't even know they were in danger from the edict of Haman. This woman who, when approached by Mordecai, wasn't sure whether or not she was willing to advocate for her people or risk her life to do so. Look at her now. She's so burdened, so burdened for her fellow Jews. She's so identified with her with her people, that she falls in desperation before the king, begging for his mercy. No fear in approaching him now. No shame in throwing herself at the feet of the king. She reminds me here a little bit of the Apostle Paul. In the book of Romans chapter 9, Paul writes something striking to me, staggering. It's convicting every time I read it. Here's what he writes in chapter 9, verse 3. For I could wish that I myself were accursed, cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. He's talking about the, the future of the, the Jewish people. And he says he's so burdened for the salvation of his, his kindred, at least in a, a physical sense, the Jewish people, that he, is, he would willingly be condemned. He would take their condemnation on himself if they would be saved. Remarkable. That's how... That's how grieved, that's how burdened he was for the salvation of the Jewish people. And Esther is doing something similar here. She tells the king that her own salvation is meaningless apart from the salvation of her people. Now the king hears this. He kind of seems slightly agitated in verse 7. He basically says, hey, what, what else do you want me to do? I, I got rid of Haman. I put him on the gallows to warn people. But this edict, it cannot be un." Done. The only thing that you could do is write a new edict to counter it. And he gives Mordecai permission to do so. Thankfully, the, the king has not learned his lesson about other people writing things in his name. And Mordecai takes advantage of it. The, the second part of our story, the salvation of God, his, his, his people, the salvation of his people, continues with a deliberate counter decree having received permission now to write something that, it could at least, that could at least give the people of God a chance, Mordecai gathers the wise men, all those under his authority, to make a plan. Look at verses 9 to 14 together. The king's scribes were summoned at that time in the third month, which is the month of Sivan, on the 23rd day 
And an edict was written according to all that Mordecai commanded concerning the Jews to the satraps, the governors, the officials of the provinces, from India all the way to Ethiopia, 127 provinces, to each province in its own script, to each people in their own language, and also to the Jews in their script, their language. And he wrote in the name of King Ahasuerus and sealed it with the king's signet ring. Then he sent the letters by mounted couriers riding on swift horses that were used in the king's service, bred from the royal stud, saying that the king allowed the Jews who were in every city to gather, defend their lives, to destroy, to kill, to annihilate any armed force of any people or province that might attack them, children and women included, and to plunder their goods. On one day throughout all the provinces of King Ahasuerus, on the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar, a copy of what was being written was to be issued as a decree in every province, being publicly displayed to all people. And the Jews were ready to be on that day to take vengeance on their enemy. So the couriers mounted on their swift horses that were used in the king's service. They rode out hurriedly, urged by the king's command, and the decree was issued in Susa, the citadel. Now these verses may sound very familiar and they are familiar on purpose. The wording around the way this process, the process of announcing this decree, writing the decree, announcing the decree, and even the actual wording of the decree itself, they are intentional because the actions here are meant to be related in our minds to Haman's actions in chapter 3, verses 12 to 14. So notice within the similarities between that passage and the passage we just read. The king's scribes are summoned. They're instructed to write exactly what the chief advisor of the king commands as if they are the words of the king himself. The edict is written and sent to the king's satraps, governors, officials of all the provinces from India to Ethiopia in all the languages represented within that empire. In fact, the only difference here in chapter 8 is that the audience is expanded in Mordecai's writing because he identifies, specifically identifies the Jewish people and says, hey, I'm I'm calling you out to make sure that you get this message. If anybody else gets this message, you need to get this message. And in so doing, he actually elevates the Jewish people in the empire. And as to the content itself, remember what Haman said in chapter 3, verse 13. This is what his edict said. With the king's permission... The whole empire is instructed to destroy, to kill, to annihilate all the Jews, young and old, women and children, in one day, the 13th day of the 12th month, the month of Adar, and plunder their goods. But then notice how Mordecai addresses. Notice how what Mordecai writes compares to what Haman wrote in verse 11. The Jews in every city, In every city of the empire, they now have the king's permission to gather, defend themselves on that day, listen, to destroy, to kill, to annihilate any armed force of any people or province that might attack them, children and women included, and to plunder their goods, verses 11 and 12. Every word of condemnation that Haman spoke against the people of God is addressed by Mordecai in his counter-edict. More than that, with the king's blessing, Mordecai has authorized the people of God to go to war, to fight for their survival. And he lets them know that the whole empire has their back. After all, the queen and the chief advisor of the king are both Jewish. If the the enemies of God's people were paying attention, they would know that the, the times are changing. That it's not in their favor to attack the people of God. And what's the result of this edict? What happens? The salvation of God's people ends with their deliverance and rejoicing. Whereas the edict issued by Haman at the end of chapter 3 ends with sadness and confusion. You may remember that's that scene where Haman and the king, they've, they've pushed out this edict and they're sitting back drinking, rejoicing, and the whole city is, is caught in confusion. People are panicking about what just took place, what happens here at the end of chapter 8 is quite different. Look at verses 15 to 17. Mordecai went out from the presence of the king in royal robes of blue and white, a golden crown on his head, a robe of fine linen and purple, and the city of Susa shouted and rejoiced. 
The Jews had light and gladness and joy and honor in every province and every city where the king's command, his edict reached, there was gladness, joy among the Jews, a feast and a holiday. Listen to this. Many from the peoples of the country even declared themselves to be Jews because fear, fear of the Jews had fallen upon them. Listen, Mordecai is no longer in sackcloth. He's no longer covered in ashes, mourning and grieving, prohibited from the presence of the king. No, he's clothed in royal robes by the king himself. And as a result, the people are not left in desperation by the whims of a a wicked advisor and a pliable king. They rejoice in the justice, the set rightness of this new counter decree. In fact, the Jewish people are so elevated, their status rises so fast that non-Jewish people want to be a part of the Jewish people just to experience some of the blessing and favor that they are experiencing in the kingdom. Rejoicing. But it does seem a little bit premature, right? Because the victory is still not yet come. The salvation that has been offered here is still just potential salvation until the battle arrives. But it also feels like the people of God know something. It also feels like Their question that we asked at the beginning of our time in the book of Esther, is God still for us? Are we still his people, even though we're in exile? It feels like that question's being asked, and God is letting them see the answer. That the answer is yes. I'm still your God. You're still my people. I'm still for you. And the evidence of that is given in chapter 9. Now, we don't have time to read all the first 19 verses of chapter 9, but needless to say, when the day comes... There are still enemies who foolishly want to go against the people of God, but God's people are given the victory. Look at chapter 9, verse 1. In the twelfth month, the month of Adar, on the thirteenth day of the same, when the king's command and edict were about to be carried out, on the day when the enemies of the Jews hoped to gain mastery over them, the reverse occurred. The Jews gained mastery over those who hated hated them. And listen to the effect. The Jews struck down all their enemies with the sword, this is verse 5, killing and destroying them, as did, and they did as they pleased to all who hated him, hated them. And Susa in particular, the Bible tells us that the Jews killed 500 men along with all the sons of Haman. And to make sure their victory was complete, the king allows them to fight the next day as well. Additional 300 enemies are killed in Susa. In total, 75,000 of Israel's enemies, perish. God gave them an improbable, seemingly impossible victory. And with that victory, the great reversal is complete. God has saved his people. He has shown them that he is still on their side. He has providentially worked for their good and his glory. And it's time to feast. It's time to celebrate. And we'll talk more about that next week. But in our remaining time together this morning, I want us to return to that verse in Romans chapter 15 that's been guiding our study of the book of Esther. Here's what Paul writes in Romans 15 verse 4. For whatever was written in the former days, it was written for our instruction that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. So how does God want to instruct us, encourage us, to lead us to endurance and hope from Esther chapter 8. I want us to look at two gospel encouragements this morning that I hope will will stir your affections for the Lord. The first encouragement has to deal with the the gospel itself. And I think it helps us appreciate the beauty of the gospel, the depths of the gospel, the depths of places that we can go to rejoice in what God has done for us in Christ. And here's that first encouragement. The gospel is the great counter-decree of human history. The gospel is the great counter-decree of human history. We saw a remarkable counter-decree in Esther chapter 8. The gospel is an even greater counter-decree. If you need encouragement this morning, if you came in needing to rejoice, find a reason to rejoice, to find hope, let's just dwell together on the beauty of the work of Christ this morning, the goodness of the good news of Jesus. Because in Genesis chapter 3, 
The Bible tells us a curse was placed upon the whole of creation because of sin. We were given a death sentence. A death sentence. We are forced to leave the presence of God. We are forced to leave the paradise that he created from us, condemned to both physical and spiritual death. Our sin caused both an immediate and an eternal separation from almighty God. And this decree of judgment, this decree against sin, it was irrevocable. Because the holiness of God demands that sin be dealt with. The holiness of God demands that our rebellion be accounted for. And listen, if this were the end of our story, we would be hopeless. If this were the end of the story, we would be a a people to be most pity. But praise be to God, it's not the end of the story that God is writing. Because while the decree of death pronounced in the garden could not be undone, God has issued a counter decree in the gospel of Jesus Christ. He has confronted the bad news of sin and death with the good news of Jesus' sacrifice. And let's consider for a moment why the counter decree of Jesus is better, much better. In Esther's story, God gave his people an opportunity to save themselves. If anyone attacked them, they could attack back. They could defend themselves. They could destroy their enemies. But there was no guarantee that they would win. He even providentially orchestrated the authorities of the kingdom to help them in their defense. And all of this opportunity was given, listen, because of the worthiness of Esther. Do you remember how she appeals to the king? If I've found favor in your sight, if I'm pleasing to the king, would you grant me this request? Would you grant me or my people the opportunity to fight for themselves? But friends, our salvation was not a fight that we could win in our own strength. Our enemies were too great for us. Moreover, we could have not earned, we never could have earned even the opportunity to fight for ourselves because there was nothing favorable or pleasing in us before a holy and righteous God. But Jesus, turn to your neighbor and say, but Jesus, bringing to bear the entire authority of God's kingdom, the entire authority of God himself worked on our behalf. He fought the battle that we could not win. He waged this war, giving us life, securing our victory in the face of certain defeat. God could not allow sin to be unaccounted for. And Jesus went to the cross to account for it. He redeemed us. He bought us back. He satisfied the wrath of God so that under the new decree of the gospel, we would not be condemned to death, but friends, we would have eternal and abundant life. Praise be to God. And now, if that wasn't enough, the favor, the favor that God looks upon the sun with, Listen, we could never have gone to God and said, is there anything favorable or beautiful in me because sin so marred us before our beautiful God. Now, if we are in Christ, he looks upon us with a favor, the goodness, the love that he has for the Son, it's extended to us. Remarkable. Remarkable what God has done for us. And if we can just for a moment, let's press even further into the work of the gospel, the work of Christ here, because I want to make sure we fully appreciate all that this text is teaching us about the work of Jesus. One of the most controversial elements of Esther is found in our text today where the people of God are authorized to eradicate their enemies. Remember verse 11? Here's what the the decree said. The Jews, who were in every city, they could gather, defend their lives, destroy, kill, annihilate any armed force of any people or province that might take them, children and women included, to plunder their goods. Interesting. That that God's people are allowed to kill, murder, annihilate the entirety of a people, wipe out their families. And the question is this, why would God allow this kind of retribution? Why would God allow this kind of war? Well, first, let's remember, the language in this edict is simply a a reflection of the edict, of the language of the edict back in chapter 3. Mordecai is allowing, authorizing his people to act in the same way that their enemies have been authorized to act against them. But remember also, God's people are only authorized to attack those who attack them first. That's a key difference. 
But there's more here. Because these actions, and in these actions, God is reminding us of his disposition toward evil, of his disposition toward wickedness, sin, and the judgment that he will bring upon it. What we see throughout the Old Testament in moments like this is a reminder that God is opposed to evil. He's opposed to those who have rejected him and his rule, to those who have chosen to worship created things rather than him as their creator. And there there are many times in the course of the Old Testament where God uses his chosen people to act as instruments of righteousness, instruments of justice against the evil, wicked people nations of the earth. And the reason why we know this is an act of judgment, remember in chapter 9, verse 10, the people of God, they they defeat their enemies. They don't plunder their goods, even though they could have. And the point here reminding us that everything that has been touched by these wicked and evil people, they are worthy of destruction. They are worthy of being removed. Now, these actions are included in the text of Scripture, I think, to startle us, to, to make us aware of the judgment and the wrath of God to to make us aware of what it is that we deserved and to feel that way, but then also to be moved to rejoicing in the gospel. Because hear me, the wrath, the culmination of all God's wrath that's meant for us, and think about all the the displays of moments like this in the course of the Old Testament where God's judgment is, is being poured out, where his wrath is being evidenced, not only in Esther 8. Think about the, the waters of judgment closing over the Egyptian army. Think about Sodom and Gomorrah being wiped by the face of the planet in the, the fire and the brimstone. Think about all of those places where God's, God's wrath and judgment are being poured out, multiply at times a gazillion, and then think about the fact that that's what we deserved. But hear me, it's also what Jesus took. Jesus took that. Jesus took that wrath upon him. Jesus took that judgment upon him to save us. We deserved annihilation. We deserved destruction. But that's not what we will receive if we are in Christ. Because in Christ, God has issued a new decree, one of redemption, one of life, one of joy. So church family, rejoice. Feast. Dance in the streets. Dance? Yes, dance. Dance. In the streets, because God has offered the most incredible counter decree in the history of humanity, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Be encouraged this morning at what God has done for you in Jesus. Now, the second encouragement has to do with our response to the gospel. Certainly, the first is an appreciation, a rejoicing in the gospel. But the second one is a response to the gospel. We are to intercede for the salvation of others. We are to seek, we are to act for the salvation of others. And i got to be honest, I've been really wrestling with this encouragement that God means for us this week in our text. Let me return to that question that we asked at the beginning of our time together today. Is your personal salvation enough for you? Are you content with your own salvation, so content that you lack compassion for those who have not yet responded to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now here's why I've been wrestling with this this week, and I imagine many of you may be wrestling in your own spirit, your own mind right now. If I'm honest, there are times in my life, even as a pastor, where I'm living in the comfort of the palace and the safety and the blessing of the king, and I forget about the brokenness that exists all around us. More than that, I think there are times where I just ignore it. I wonder if anyone can relate to that. And listen, I know as we begin to talk about this, our immediate response may be guilt, and I don't, in no way am wanting to send anyone on a guilt trip here, okay? So if that's the enemy saying guilt, 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 reject that, That's not what I think this text is meaning to stir in us this morning, but I do want us to feel moved. I do want us to feel the same way that those people who who saw the story about those Thai boys being stuck in a cave and it moved them to action. That's what I'm hoping for us. As we're reminded of the dangers, we're reminded of the, the certainty of what is coming. If we believe the gospel 
We believe the scripture. We believe these things are actually going to happen. I want us to be moved to a place where we would respond. Respond. It's easy for us as Christians, especially American Christians, to be like Esther in chapter 4 instead of Esther in chapter 8. Even as a part of God's people, we can become so comfortable and disconnected from the needs of the world that we are moved to apathy. Isn't that true? Like, the more that we're around God's people, the more that we're in the church, the more that we can internalize, the more that we can have our view looked on, our, our view of the world change and only be concerned about what's happening here instead of what's happening out there. We look inside instead of outside. And church, we have to fight that. We have to constantly, constantly fight that. And so let's ask God to uh, uh, reawaken us as a people, to speak to us. As Mordecai spoke to Esther way back in our, our text, when, when Mordecai said to Esther, God is working. God is working to secure the salvation of his people. And what if he wants to use you to do it? Church, God is working. God is working to bring about the salvation of, of millions and billions of people around the world. And what if he wants to use us to do it? Listen, church, I think, Bayleaf, I think we are being positioned, uniquely positioned by God to put a dent in the lostness of North Raleigh and in places all around the world. And so I'm asking us, can we, can we ask God to help us be Esther chapter 8, not Esther chapter 4? As, as individuals, as a whole church, we are being positioned, positioned to act for the advancement of the gospel. And I, I can hear echoes of this. I know. I know from conversations with you that relationships are being formed in our neighborhoods, in our schools, with the intention of being able to share the gospel. I know that conversations are actively happening. I know that partnerships are being formed strategically with other like-minded churches. Plans are being made. Do you know right now we have three couples in our church who are planning to uproot their lives and move overseas to help people who do not know Christ know about Christ? That's happening right now in our church. We've already had a church plant sent out from our church. We're engaged in revitalizations. It's clear that God is blessing our next generation ministry. We had two this morning, 19 people baptized yesterday. Praise be to God. I mean, that's incredible when we see how God is working. But here's what I, I, I firmly believe. Here's what I think. I think these are just tastes. I believe that. I believe these are foretastes of a greater work that God wants to do in and through us. By the way, that's why we're doing what we're doing at Creedmoor Road. Because we know that God is bringing thousands and thousands of people here who do not know Jesus. We know that people are moving here who need a church home. And we believe that God has given us that property to help make disciples locally and globally for the glory of God, to help saturate North Raleigh with the gospel. And yes, there is risk. Yes, there's risk. We're, we're trying to follow the plans that God has given to us, but it's, it's, it's going to cost a lot of money. There's risk attached to it, but we believe the risk is worth the reward because we want people to know about Christ. And we, we keep that same mentality, that same posture in everything we do as a church. And listen, so why I know, why I know that many of you in this room are living with this kind of gospel sensitivity, in order for us to truly make a dent in the lostness of North Raleigh, in order for us with partners and with, with like-minded partners to truly make a dent in the lostness of the world, it will require all of us, not some of us, all of us. And so here's the question, Jared, what do I do? What do I, how do I act? How, if I'm, if I'm burdened this morning and I'm recognizing the reality of lostness, what do I do? Listen, the application is right here in the text. So as the plans were made in verses 9 to 13, let's think first, would you pray? Would you plead? Plead on behalf of the lost. Maybe you've got a, a loved one and you don't know if they know Jesus. Maybe you've got a kid. You don't know if they know Jesus. Maybe you have a, a neighbor, a coworker, a fellow student. You don't know if they know Jesus. Let me ask you, do you pray like Esther prayed for them? Do you, do you fall at the face of Jesus and say, God, 
Would you save them? Would you change their eternity? And would you use me to do it? Or if you don't know anybody, if you think, I, Jared, I don't, I've been kind of closed off. I don't, I don't know anybody that doesn't know the Lord. Would you begin praying right now for the Lord to bring you somebody to have a conversation with? And here's what I know. That is in the will of the Father. And if you pray for that, he will honor it. He will do it. So begin by praying. Begin by pleading. And start with one person. Listen, I, I'm not, none of us in this room are asking you to be responsible for the entire billions of people who are lost in the world. But we are asking you to pray for one. To start there. And then after you pray, let's prepare. Let's gather together, just as the, the king's scribes did, as Mordecai led them to do. Let's prepare to engage lostness. And we can help you here. Pastor Kyle loves to train in evangelism. We have tons of resources that we can put in your hand, cards, Bibles, tracts, and even just conversation starters. Prepare. Ask God to, to prepare you to be able to help you know the words to share, to be able to help, help articulate your own testimony for the sake of the gospel. Let's pray. Let's prepare. Let's mobilize. Let's take action as the servants of the king did here. Let's get on our horses. Let's not just plan forever. Let's do something. Let's start inviting people into our homes. Let's start invite people to, to coffee or lunch. Let's get to know them, have conversations with them, figure out if they have any experience with the Lord in their life. If there's brokenness, the gospel can speak to and be able to share the gospel. Let's mobilize locally. Let's mobilize globally. Let's continue, church family, to go to nations that need the gospel. Let's continue to go to, to city centers where lostness is great in Toronto, in London, in Ethiopia, in, in Thailand. Let's continue to mobilize for the sake of the gospel. And when we get there, let's proclaim. Guys, this is good news. This is good news that we should, should try to get in every person's language and every nation of the world so they can hear what God has done for them in Jesus and that God would use us to articulate. And listen, as we pray, as we prepare, as we mobilize and proclaim, and we see God bring spiritual fruit among us and among the nations, then let's rejoice. Because God's still in the business of saving people, isn't he? And we're all evidence of that here. But let's not be satisfied. Let's not be so content with our own salvation, so distracted by the comforts of our own life that we forget the great commission that God has entrusted to us. Let's ask God to move us, to be faithful, to pray, to prepare, to mobilize, to proclaim, and to rejoice until he returns. Amen? Let me ask you, has Jesus saved you? Praise be to God. If not, then today can be the day of your salvation. The Bible tells us that counter decree of the gospel, what God has done for us in Jesus, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised you from the dead, you can be saved. Your future can be changed in a moment. Would today be the day of your salvation? Come talk to us. We'll have pastors in the front after the service. Has Jesus saved you? If he has... Are you willing to let him use you to help save others? He wants to. He's left us here for a purpose. Oh, that we would be open, sensitive to the work of the gospel around us and be blessed to be used by God toward his redemptive ends. Wherever you are, you bow your heads. Maybe this morning you need to pray. Maybe this morning you need to plead. If you want to use these steps up here as an altar, if you want to grab somebody beside you and just say, hey, would you pray for me for the salvation of my son, my daughter, my mom, my dad, my aunt, my neighbor, my coworker? Would you ask God to give an opportunity for me to share what God has done for me? I feel nervous about it but I'm compelled. Let's pray to that. Let's pray, to, let's pray for Thailand this morning and not 
just because we were directed to in the service. Let's pray because we're convicted and we're burdened for the, this people who need Jesus. There's a greater salvation needed in Thailand than the one that we talked about earlier. And then, if you don't know Jesus, we're praying for your salvation right now. Would you respond? Father, would you help us be a more faithful people? Respond as you lead us to this morning because of our time around your word. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. You stand and respond as the Lord leads. Thank you for joining us this week at Bayleaf. For more information about Bayleaf Baptist Church, visit our website at bayleaf.org.